So the practice of the meditation, which we'll do after we have a, a break and get a bit of fresh air, the practice of the meditation is to relax into this openness and moment by moment as experience occurs, just to give it space and to observe how we have a tendency to locate ourselves in relation to that experience. Some of that location is in terms of physical sensation, maybe it feels like the back of your head or something around your heart, could be anything, sometimes in relation to a thought. The ego will always position itself in relation to experience. I am having this experience. But the, what we take as the ego, the notion of I, me, myself, is itself an arising. You don't have to destroy your ego or get rid of it. The ego is not the problem. The ego is overinflated by the misidentification that it is the true site of being, the true site of identity. It's not the whole story. The, the ego suffers in the way that a parental child suffers. If the parents are unavailable or delinquent, the child will have to try to face tasks which are beyond its capacity. The child won't have an adult around to help it settle, to reassure it. And it will have to be trying to take care of big people who should be taking care of it. This is what happens when ignorance arises in the mind. The ego, which is the child of awareness, has lost its mummy and now thinks, well, I'm in charge. So it's running around the house, setting fire to the furniture, pissing on the sofa. Because the child doesn't know what to do. This is the nature of samsara. We are mad children with this huge responsibility because actually our nature is infinity. But we've lost connection with that infinity. <coughs> So we are the finite pretending to be infinite. That's what the ego is. I am this, I am that, I am, I am, I am. The ego is always saying, I am. It'll be, I am anything. Tony Blair says, I am the prime minister of this country. How could this be? <laughs> what mad illusion is this? So, I am can appropriate anything. George Bush is, can say, I am the most powerful man in the world. What is the basis for this? Absolute madness, isn't it? Absolutely mad that this thug is the most powerful man in the world. But it's undeniable he is the most powerful man in the world in some ways. Or at least the most powerful puppet in the world. So I am can claim anything. That is because it has an infinite capacity hidden just below the surface of being finite. The one who says, I am hungry. The one who says, I need a pee. The one who says, God, this is all very complicated. That one is itself the infinite awareness. But it doesn't recognize it's the infinite awareness. So it has a sense of being infinite while actually being finite because it's a momentary arising. So the momentary arising is being suffused with the energy of the infinite, and of course has a hyperinflation. This is what narcissism is. It's the wind of infinity blowing into a very small weak vessel, who, <gasps> having exploded up like a big toad, doesn't know how to breathe out. <laughs> this is what the ego is doing all the time, pretending, playing these games of illusion not being able to step back, to apologize, to let go, to confess. So, and get this, the next, uh, last point before we take a break is about rangdrol, about self-liberation. All phenomena which can be, uh, which are sites of attachment, whether we see them as object or subject, are self-liberating. But the key point we need to do is on the experience of openness to allow the self-liberation of all the points of ego's familiar identification. Because this ego, like a child who's, that's been left with too much responsibility, is always a bit anxious. Like in India, 
you see these uh, young girls, maybe eight years of age, and they're carrying their mama's baby on their hip. And they're wandering around all day long looking after this baby. Well, they don't know exactly everything to do with a small baby. So they've got to be responsible when they're hardly able to be responsible for themselves. They can't run around and be free because they now have this responsibility. The ego is over-responsible. But if you ask somebody who's over-responsible to relax, they'll find it very difficult because they will imagine, if I relax, something terrible will happen. It's all up to me. This is what the ego feels. It's all up to me. If I don't hold it together, it'll fall apart. But, sweetie, it's always been falling apart. That's what impermanence is. Everything's impermanent. It's always falling apart. This is self-liberation. This is where the ego can't get it right. Because the ego will always try to resist reality by imagining that it's got to keep things tidier than they can be. So our ego is like a, an anxious child with OCD. You know, it's obsessive, it's compulsive, it's driven to do things when actually it simply needs to let go. And let go of itself. Retirement. Retirement is difficult for many people. Because who will I be if I'm not useful? You'll be useless. <laughs> I don't want to be useless. Why not? Why not be useless? The flowers of the field toil not. Yeah. It's just there, just there. As Milton says, you know, in that wonderful poem on his blindness, they also serve who only stand and wait. But we are driven to this notion that if we're not busy, if we're not constructing something, if we're not doing something, if we're not creating value, we will have no value. This is the prime anxiety of the ego. The ego knows it is empty and fears that emptiness as, as if it's a kind of bad smell, as if it shut its pants in some way. And so it has to cover it up and cover it up by showing, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm useful, I'm useful, I'm useful. But it's actually empty. And this emptiness is not shameful. It's the emptiness of all phenomena. So this is why ignorance is so painful. Because ignorance is the belief that things are truly existing when they're not. And so if you buy into that lie, so much suffering arises from trying to maintain the illusion. And then to make yourself worthwhile by showing that you are good and kind and honest and reliable and useful. And all you're doing is breathing in and out like a cow in the field. What are the wonderful things we do? Not more than a bag of beans. And after a while we get very old and we can't do them anymore. When I go to see my old mother, she always says, Oh, I can't even make you a cup of tea. Sweetie. My mom, I told but I, I should, I should be doing something. Why? You know, her whole life, I should be doing something. This is heartbreaking. I love her so much. She did so much for me, but the main thing she did for me was smile at me, and laugh with me, and hold my hand. That was more important than cups of tea. And that's the whole thing, isn't it? That from the very beginning, all phenomena are woven together, connected. That connection is the natural perfection and integration of everything. But we, being in the Garden of Eden, imagining we are out of the Garden of Eden, try to create concrete tenements as a substitute. This is the ego's domain. Very sad. <laughs>